people who are part of the editorial board of the book in question, which has gone missing somewhere, by the way. So yeah, so, so that those three people, Prakasha, Martin Farek, and Sufia Pathan, will speak about the book and the current research, keeping the questions that came from the floor in mind. And uh, other three scholars, invited scholars, will respond to the discussions on the dais, the questions that have come from the floor. And before I hand over the mic to them, let me introduce uh, the topic of the session, topic of the roundtable discussion. As ag again, I'll get down to the business end of the topic. See, for if you believe the textbooks that you have been reading, sociology or any other textbook, even political science or whatever, which talks about caste system, it looks as though for the last 3,000 years or 4,000 years, we have not been able to solve the problem, the problem, the so-called uh, caste system problem. For now, let's accept that there is something called caste system problem in India, and it's something that needs to be solved. But the sad thing is, if you take this as the starting point, it follows that we have not solved this problem for the last three to 4,000 years. And people like Buddha to Basava to Gandhi have fought against it, yet we have not been able to solve it. That says two things, at least two things. One, the problem is so huge, there's no way we are going to solve it. If Buddha has not a, couldn't solve it, I don't think I can solve it, or definitely I don't think any of us here can solve it. But then, that is a very, very a weak way of talk, thinking about a problem. There is no other example in, in human knowledge, in, in human sciences, in social sciences, and natural sciences, of a problem which has uh, bogged us for 4,000 years and we have not been able to solve it. We have not even been able to understand it. That leads to the second scenario. Probably, probably, just for the sake of considering, allow the possibility that possibly we have not been able to understand the problem. If we had understood the problem, we may have uh, solved the problem. This brings us to a very interesting situation. What is it that we have to understand now? What is it that, if we have to understand this problem, where do we begin? What do we do? So much of the discussion that were happening on the dais and will happen now and will continue in the next session are trying to understand what is this problem that has now become a huge burden on our head. We go around be behaving as though it's a stigma that has stuck to us, something that we have not been able to remove for 4,000 years. Is it even conceptually, can you even begin to understand something like that? That is the challenge before us. So let's start with the statement that was often made here in the last day and a half, that uh, something called caste system does not exist. Before you understand what the statement is saying, try to understand what the statement is not saying. It is not saying that jatis or caste do not exist in India. They do exist. There is no way we are going to deny the existence of caste. Like I am from Bhadravati, Bhadravati exists. You are from Mangalore, Mangalore exists. Somebody is from London, London exists. There are jatis. Whatever they are, somebody is a Brahmin, somebody is a Madiga, somebody is a Lingayat, somebody is a Jain, they all exist. So we are not saying the jatis do not exist. We are not saying that problems in Indian society do not exist. No, no, this is not a conference to finally write the certificate that all Indians are saints. No, we are not. We are as bad or as good as any other human community that has ever lived on earth. Maybe a little bit more, a little bit less. Nobody has done research. We are not saying India has never seen problems. Indian society doesn't have problems which need solution. No, we are not saying that. Then what are we saying? We are saying in the, in our, for some historical reasons, for some psychological reasons, some intellectual reasons, we have come to believe that many of the problems that we have and we do not have come together and form something called, you know the Kannada word we use, gumma? I don't know how to translate it into English. It's a, a caste system has become a gumma for us. So it is something which is behind the curtains. A apparently it has, it has many teeth. And have you heard the story, the ch children's story called Gruffalo? How many of you have heard Gruffalo's story? The caste system has become Gruffalo for us. So 
Here is the situation. We are saying, when we say there is no caste system, that this idea of caste system with many, many properties that we ascribe to it, it has been around for about three to 4,000 years. It has one, one uh, hierarchy where Brahmins are always on the top and they are oppressors. Shudras are always at the bottom. They are always being oppressed. That it uh, has self-perpetuated itself for over 4,000 years. These kind of arguments and a system which is pan-Indian. India is just a word used here, remember? We are talking about 4,000 year old geographical space. That India of that time, quote-unquote, India consisted of place from Afghanistan to Indonesia to Sri Lanka to Maldives and to India, the current uh, political India. We are saying a system which perpetuated, which spread itself, which sustained for 4,000 years is something that we cannot sociologically, empirically, conceptually can even talk about. Why? The question comes. See, 4,000 years ago, if you don't know, there was no WhatsApp, Facebook, there was no even the public TV channels where they will you know, bombard you with uh, live telecasts and breaking news, etc. So it is impossible to imagine that a handful of uh, so-called Brahmins sat in some part of Kashmir or Afghanistan or wherever and imagine, okay, we will have this system now, so we will um, create this hierarchy and then so some people will always be oppressed, etc. And then WhatsApp it to the fellow Brahmins in Kerala and Maldives. No, it didn't happen that way. It couldn't have happened that way. So then ask a very, very simple question that my son, five-year-old son, will ask if I tell him this story. But daddy, how is it possible that some such thing existed if there was no WhatsApp, Facebook, there was no TV? So how did this system got created? How did this situation? So mil multiple kingdoms came, went, multiple kind of rulings were came and went from you know, Mughals to Britishers to Guptas and whatnot, yet it survived. How is this even possible? That is where you will start thinking, or probably you will allow a question to ask yourself. Is the kind of things that we allow to exist in our mind, is it really possible? Remember the sentence that I said yesterday, that one uh, ascribed to Einstein? The same kind of thinking that has gone into the creation of a problem will not solve the problem. So if you want to solve this so-called idea of problem of caste, whether because you think it's uh, absolute conceptual nonsense, or you think really think there is some caste problem which has to be solved, either way, you have to have a different mindset now. Otherwise, we will do the same thing that many people think we have been doing for 4,000 years. Instead of solving the problem, we are creating more problems. So this is the context for this round table. Now I'll allow, in this order, Martin Farek, uh, Prakasha, Martin Farek, and Sufia Patan to present the arguments from the, from, as the editors of the book. 10 minutes each they will have, and the other three people will have 10 minutes each, and then the discussion to the floor. Okay, thank you. What do you need to be to be a victim of to make a complaint under the caste atrocities legislation. Can I be a Brahmin and be a victim under the caste, uh, the caste atrocities legislation? No. Yeah, so I need to be SC or ST, right? That's it. It's because it's perceived, even in the title it says scheduled caste and scheduled tribes. So to be a victim, I, can, I have to be one of the listed categories of scheduled caste and scheduled tribes. Even there, there's a, l a little bit of sort of, let's say, relative certainty. Now, if you come to Britain, it's not like that. Why? Because the only mention in the law will be caste. So who has to decide whether there is caste in the case and whether there is caste discrimination in the case? Who is going to have to decide that? Who has to decide? You tell me. Right? If I bring a case in court, of course I have, to be, I have to decide, my lawyers have to decide, and the judges and the tribunal members, they have to decide. Right? Finally, they will decide what caste is, whether I belong to a particular caste, uh, whether there was caste discrimination in the case, right? So whether something happened to me was because of the caste factor in the case. And so our poor British judges uh, and tribunal members will have to start defining what caste is. This is something which Indian judges have not had to do. So if I was a British judge, what would I do? Should I read maybe Venkatji's text, this massive text on Jati and Chanjati? then I will know what caste is. 
And so what if I, as an English judge I say, oh, this is a biocultural formation of some type. That makes sense to a British judge? Right? So you can see the kind of situation our poor British judges and lawyers are being put into, right? They are going into a territory which is completely dark for them. They have no clue, right, what a caste is really, right? Um, maybe they can call Prakash Shah and he can give an expert witness statement in the court and then, you know, they, maybe they don't have any option. They have to believe what I say because there's no alternative story, right? But then maybe I also have rivals in the United Kingdom, so I have rival academics, right, who will come, come and give the opposite story. So as a judge, how do I know what to do? You know, some, we've already heard this story, like Martin was saying, you know, in the postmodern period, everybody's interpretation is true. Well, the, the judges don't have that luxury, do they? They have to decide who is right and who is wrong, right? Not everybody's interpretation is true, right? So according to the rules of evidence, whether or not, yeah, a particular story makes sense in the light of the law, they have to decide that, right? So you, you don't have the luxury to say, okay, let's not argue, let's agree to disagree, you are right and I'm right, according to our own view. It's not like that, right? It, it has to be some sort of, uh, what Martinji was saying about, like, almost like a scientific evaluation that the judges have, have to go into. Okay, so that's the scenario. So we don't have the legislation implemented yet. Now, what happened in the meantime? A couple of years ago, more than a couple, maybe in 2014, a case was brought into the uh, employment tribunal in England. Now, in that case, of course, we know that caste is not part of the law yet. There is a promise to make it part of the law, but it's not part of the law. There is an employment dispute. There is actually a couple uh, who are originally from Delhi, from New Delhi in India, who settled in UK. They came with their uh, the maid servant, right? So somebody who was working for them already when they were in Delhi. They brought her as well. And she was taking care of the children and you know cooking, cleaning the house, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then, after about two years. Uh, she got her residence permit. Then she brought a case against her employers. Right? So she must have gone through some lawyers, I think, who were connected to her uh, church group in, in UK. And at first, there's no issue of caste. When the case is initially brought to the courts, they say, oh, well, this is actually a case of underpayment, right? It's like exploitation. You're paying too little to this lady and, you know, she should be paid fairly under the, under the British level of, uh, you know, wages which are set by the employment law, etc., etc. And so we don't hear anything about caste. But after the case has initially been brought, the lawyers think, ah, you know what we should do? We should add a caste element to this. So they try to say, ah, besides the employment aspects and the under, under, under uh, payment aspects, uh, there's also caste discrimination in the case. Now, on what grounds do they argue that? Uh, all this story actually comes out as a preliminary issue in the hearing in the employment tribunal, right? So this is the first time we hear of the case in public, right? Before that, we wouldn't know about this case. Because the employment tribunal's preliminary judgment is reported, right? It's circulated throughout for everybody to see, like on WhatsApp and the internet and so on. So what we discover is that the claim rests not just on underpayment, but the lady who is employed says, oh, I'm an Adivasi from Bihar and I'm also a Christian, right? And because of my caste status, I was underpaid. In fact, I, was, I would not have been recruited in Delhi when, when the decision to recruit me happened were it not for my caste status. How do, the, how do they, my employers know about my caste status? Well, you know, actually when I first came to meet them in Delhi, I was wearing a white sari with a red border. That, anybody in Delhi would know that that is a sign that I'm a low caste person or a tribal person who, uh, who's, you know, whose people like in my uh, jati or janjati, right, in my tribal group, we wear this kind of sari on festival occasions and my employer would know that I'm a low caste person. So, and that's the only reason they hired me, otherwise they wouldn't have hired me. And then when I came to the UK, you know, uh, sometimes, when I drank from a, from a cup, they would immediately, immediately wash the cup, right? And so this is another part of the story about. And then, uh, oh, oh, my employers also hid the, the Bible. You know, I brought a Bible in my suitcase and then they, they hid it somewhere in the house so I couldn't find it, something like that. And so these are the various facts which she comes out with as evidence of caste discrimination. 
I don't know how it's, how does it sound to you? Convincing so far? Yeah, it must be caste discrimination. Especially the cup washing element. No, glass washing element. No caste discrimination, are you sure? What about the white sari with the red border? Surely that's a, that's a telltale sign of caste discrimination, right? Yes, no? No, no, please just stick to the story I gave you, yeah? Not the atrocities act, nothing like that. Just the story. Is there caste discrimination in this story, which I've told you so far? Now, okay, uh, uh, I want to carry on with the, with the story, otherwise we'll be here all, all morning, right? Or all afternoon even. Um, now, because it's a preliminary issue in the case, the judges have to decide, can we uh, treat this as a caste discrimination case? Does the caste issue already, uh, does the law already cover caste? Bear in mind that our statutory instrument has not been issued, it has not been implemented, nothing. So the question is, does the law already cover caste discrimination, right? Now, the short story is that the judge agrees, the employment tribunal judges agree that, yes, what we can do, we can take ethnicity, which is, a co which is covered, that's already part of race, and we know from a previous case in the uh, UK Supreme Court that Ethnicity is already covering descent-based discrimination, right? And caste is a bit like descent, right? Or at least some interpretation of caste, some acceptable interpretation of caste can be linked to descent. And that means that what we can say is that our legislation already covers caste discrimination, right? And they use various other devices. They, yesterday I was talking about the United Nations. One of the things they do is they refer to the United Nations Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Now, I don't know if you know this story, but in that convention, dissent discrimination is already unlawful, according to international human rights law, right? Now, that convention is not directly applicable in UK law, right? Because we, like you guys, we have a dualistic international law system, so we don't immediately recognize every treaty that we sign up to. So, somehow the judges have to find a way to bring it into the legal order. Second part, European law. Europe. European Union already has a directive which we call the race directive, right? It, cover, it covers instances of race discrimination. Now, what the clever judges in the tribunal, in the British tribunal did, they said, well, we are already bound by the uh, European race directive. That's directly effective in the law. And if you look at the European race directive, uh, it was meant to cover uh, the kind of situation that the International Convention on Elimination of Racial Discrimination already s speaks about. True or false? I did some investigation, I, I, I give you part of the story in the, in the chapter in the book. When I looked at the European Union records, they don't mention anything about the uh, dissent-based discrimination. They don't mention anything about caste-based discrimination, right? So what the British judges are doing is actually using a kind of device, but they don't themselves, they don't fully research it. And they say, oh, because of this, we can also interpret our own law, which covers ethnicity, dissent, and therefore caste. And so our law covers as well, right? So first legal point, the preliminary issue is over and done with. But then the, uh, the defendants, they say, oh, we are not satisfied, right? We want to contest this. So it goes to the Employment Appeal Tribunal. Employment Appeal Tribunal basically agrees with the initial judgment. They say, yes, under certain cir circumstances, as long as you can show that the type of discrimination we are talking about is related to dissent-based discrimination. So if it's caste-based discrimination of a type of situation which you can fit into dissent-based discrimination, it's fine. You can bring a case under the Equality Act already. Great. So then the, then the case gets remitted to a second employment tribunal, and this is where the factual findings are made. But actually, the factual findings are not investigated any further. The story that I said to you about, you know, the sari and the cop and her own Adivasi background, that is the fullest extent of the story that we get in the whole case, right? We are none the, none the wiser. So what the next empl employment tribunal have done, they just accepted everything that was claimed in the earlier story. They didn't dissect it, they were not cross-examined, there was no expert evidence, et cetera, et cetera, right? The story was just taken at, at face value. And they said, ah, actually, we think there is caste discrimination in this case if we accept all the facts that were pleaded before. Now, Let's, let's try and look at the other side of the story. Let's say if Prakasha or, I don't know, some, 
any of the panel members here uh, gave expert evidence in the case, what would I have said? Uh, one of the things I would have said is that, well, uh, we're talking about a tribal woman here, right? So do tribal people fall into the caste system? They schedule caste and they schedule tribes. So tribes have the, it seems like they have their own, if you look at the Indian law, they, it seems like they have their own category. So what has this got to do with the caste system? Nobody tells you anything. If I was a, maybe, if I was an expert witness, I, I might have asked the question, uh, you know, before we can decide a case of discrimination, do we not need to know the caste background of, of both the sides, like the employers and the employee? Do you agree with that? Yeah, you should know the caste background. What if the employee is from an even lower caste background, right, hypothetically, than the, uh, if the employer is even lower caste background than the employee, what are you going to do? Have a look at the documents in that case. I'll make them publicly available to you. I'll put them up on a website or something for you to look at. Tell me if you see anywhere in the three judgments that we have anything, any information about the caste background of the employers. In my reading, nothing. Right? The employing couple, you will not know from the judgments what caste background they are. In fact, I even talked to them. And we, I, in fact, even when we had our conversation, they couldn't tell us what caste. The guy is somewhere from Afghanistan somewhere, right? So this is like, a, he's a Hindu guy from Afghanistan. And then at some point, both of them converted to Buddhist, being, being Buddhist, right? If converted is the right word. But anyway, they are following some Buddhist sansta thing somewhere in Delhi or now in UK. Now, of course, if the Ambedkarites are right, then, you know, conversion to Buddhism exempts you from the caste system altogether, right? So maybe to complicate matters more, as an expert witness, I would have put that knife in and said, look, they are Buddhists. What, what caste system are you talking about? They are supposed to be formally outside the caste system, aren't they? If the story about the Buddha, that is true. Which is probably not true, but anyway, let's go along with it. Uh, so actually, if you look at it, yeah, like, just like Duncanji was saying, there are so many factual things which actually you could say contradict the story that's given. Right? So it's, you could say there's one side of the story, which is the plaintiff story, the employee story, and then there's the story which the hypothetical theoretical expert witness, right? Since there wasn't an expert witness, maybe you can say the judges and the lawyers should have tested that. Nobody does any kind of testing. Yeah? In the three bouts of litigation you have, employment tribunal, employment appeal tribunal, and then back to the employer, nobody asks these questions. How comes? Right? So now, yeah, after the case happened, it was advertised by the lawyers in the case on the plaintiff side as conclusively proving the existence of caste discrimination in the United Kingdom. That's how the case, right? Now, I don't know if you guys feel that, yeah, this case conclusively proves anything. To me, it doesn't prove much, yeah? But this is the story that we are supposed to believe about the caste discrimination. And this is the leading case we have in the United Kingdom now, today, right? Which proves the existence of caste discrimination. Now, you can see the problem that maybe you can say, okay, you know, over a period of time, our judges will learn and learn. Yeah, they will, they will learn how to interpret cases about caste. They will learn to define what caste is over a period of time, etc., etc. I don't know how many wrong cases they have to go through before some, such a thing will happen. Many people will suffer. This particular employer couple, we realized that I, I know the lawyer who, who worked with them, who worked to defend them in the final stages of litigation, they lost their house because of this claim, the legal claim, right? They had a house of whatever, in a nice neighborhood in London, just in the suburbs of London somewhere. They lost their house. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, basically they've been made bankrupt effectively. On the basis of this kind of specious story. I think it's a specious story. I think it's even made up because, you know why I think, one of the reasons I think that, not only because the story doesn't actually hold together, but if you look at the interview that the plaintiff gave after the final stage of the litigation, she was interviewed on television, on BBC TV, by the way, where the commentator in the BBC TV says, oh, yeah, well, this is conclusive evidence that caste discrimination exists, etc., etc." But listen closely to the bit where she is interviewed. She doesn't mention caste once in the story she does for the interview. Right? It's the commentators from the BBC who supply the caste discrimination part of the story. Right? 
I, I'm, I'm left wondering if she even understood what was going, in, going on in the proceedings, right? Most probably not. These are the lawyers who constructed these arguments in the UK. At a late stage in the proceedings, we don't know exactly why. I tried to communicate with the, her lawyers as well. No reply. Initially, they talked to me quite freely. But once I started to ask more searching questions about how the issue of caste discrimination was first introduced in the case, they stopped talking to me. So there's a lot of weird stuff going on here. Now, I'll just round it off by saying that, my, you know, my earlier observation about how, see, this kind of story would not have made sense unless we already presuppose the existence of a caste system in the background. Right? So although our judges are not experts in caste or whatever, even they have some, you know, Martin, you were saying earlier on, like that uh, Europeans have some common sense notion about how Indians regularly discriminate on caste grounds. That's a story that we have. We, we are brought up on those story, stories as Europeans living in Europe, right? And it's very difficult to demolish th these stories because they've part, become part of the common sense, right? Um, and I would suggest that our judges, lawyers, tribunal members, etc., etc., also share this set of stories. And that's why, because of their common sense notions and their idea that there is a caste system which is inherent to Indian culture and society, uh, we can easily conclude that this was, must have been a case of now, look at the other thing that this case is doing. It's creating a presumption against the defendant, right? Normally, if you bring a case, right, in the court, you have to prove, your, uh, particularly in civil claims, right, you have to prove your side of the story. In this case, it's the opposite which is going on. It, it's assumed, because of this background elephant in the room, it's assumed that you must be guilty of discrimination, and you have to disprove that you were, you were guilty. So the onus is on the defendant. You're already guilty, and you have to prove that you're not guilty. Guilt, guilt, guilt and innocence is not the best phrasing, because it, this is a civil, civil law matter. But still, you get, you get the point. Uh, so I will leave it there, and maybe there are some questions and observations. I am in a funny situation now because questions, especially the question about Aryans, is calling for me to tell you something of uh, a friend's chapter and not mine. <laughs> so I think it should be done. So I hope you don't mind that I skip completely my argument and my part on how about Haas, Jainas and later on different Bhakti traditions are not trying to reform anything and they are in fact not against the caste system and I will be hoping that some of you will come and read it <laughs> but th there was a question concerning Aryans and again time constraints so the thing that I try to do now please understand what it is just to give you a bullet point overview otherwise we go into very long discussion Aryans there are conferences on Aryans hundreds of books are there on that discussion so I will very briefly Tell what Marianne Kepens, our colleague and friend, tried to argue. Uh, and you can see. Let's see what the response would be. So when we look at the issue, typically you learn the story of the dawn on civilization and culture in India that goes as description of clash between two peoples, or maybe three peoples. That's also a discussion. But uh, uh, you have a story that tells you that there were Dravidians in India, maybe authors of Indu, uh, or people in the Indus Valley civilization, who knows. And then those uh, more civilized and more advanced Aryans came in and they were able to take over at least the north of India and somehow either pushed or overruled, overruled the Dravidians. And through Brahminical groups, we have the villain priestly class again in the picture. Through Brahminical groups, they were able, and their settlements, they were able to start to influence and finally uh, subdue in some sense even the south of India. So that's the story in very short.
the role of Vedas and Vedic ritual plays a central role. You know, it, it is understood that Aryans were more civilized, not only technologically, all this talk about chariots and weapons and you know, archery, but they were also civilized more than the locals uh, in terms of having better and interesting, more interesting religion. So what Marian does, and now I am really going into bullet points, is uh, lo looking at all problems that the story has. I will summarize it in a different order intentionally than the chapter goes. But please go and read it. Uh, first of all, uh, which many people do not know till today, archaeologists and uh, physical anthropologists working both in India and outside will tell you today there is no evidence for a new invading or even migrating people coming in that times to India or even slightly before or even slightly later. If you think, if you want to have more evidence, come to me later because I will just quote books and people. But this is a conclusion of several conferences. This is a conclusion of uh, several in-depth researches in physical anthropology, studying, uh, you know, the uh, uh, bones, uh, uh, remnants of DNA, etc. So we have no evidence that there was not even invasion, but not even immigration. Different people were coming in and out, but. This particular time, 1500 BC, there is no archaeological evidence supportive of the claim. If this is so, of course many people started to ask, oh, how did we come to that idea? And if you go and look in, into it properly, you will realize uh, that the idea is much more older than archaeology itself. We find the traces of the discussion about Brahmins or Brahminical tribes or groups coming to India in 17th and 18th century Europe again, you know. Our forefathers were very curious about India. <laughs> they had all kinds of questions and for them they were important, but this I will not go into. So you have people like Voltaire and Bailey discussing about Brahmins coming to India. You have later on others, Marianne is giving more names, again I will not go into that. There is Eugen Burnau, very famous orientalist of the first half of 19th century, many, many names. Important books, very influential, let's say, research. And there Marianne shows one thing that is very interesting and she's really pinpointing it very well. She shows how some of these people, at least, were admitting that we don't have an evidence of the invasion. It's before archaeology in the place. You know, first half of 19th century mainly we are talking of. And there Marianne is able to quote, uh, I will give only one example, you may be aware of Elphinstone and his history of India, right? So there Elphinstone is doing a very strange thing because he says, yeah, evidence is hardly there, but somehow this is very probable story. <laughs> to keep it in brief, again, very brief bullet point about it. Go read more about it. So this is how discussions on Aryans emerged. Very doubtful, very shaky speculations on what happened. Now Marianne is giving a, an important link there to biblically rooted, biblically framed story of the sons of Noah. You know, back then in the half, first half of 19th century, most of the Europeans still believed in the literal truth of biblical description of history. People, it's before Darwin. So back then many people believed in little uh, truth of, of the general flood of the earth and then sons of Noah was, uh, and the progeny of Noah was populating the earth again. So within these discussions they linked to be Aryans. They still didn't talk about them mainly as Aryans. But this is another important link that uh, some people before Marian looked into. Now what is, uh, I would say in some sense, uh, even more important is a certain meta theoretical level that Marianne is describing in the chapter because all these discussions are showing us that we should study in depth again mainly European thought on how nation or race which was more or less easily interchanged in the first half of the 19th century as concepts are connected with religion and language. Because typically, and this is another insertion, bullet point again, 
typically people will tell you, but there is amply, uh, there's lots of uh, linguistic evidence, no? Now, I did little Sanskrit, I did some little research in that area. Uh, what is obvious is that Indo-European languages as they are called today are uh, connected in many ways. That, I mean that you can prove linguistically true, but there is no proof and in fact uh, hardly any serious uh, research into how it happened. Because when you go to people like William Jones and then later generations of Orientalists, they were still operating in the biblical framework and for, for them naturally one language develops from another and there is one mother language because this is only one people that are spreading across the globe. But why should we accept this idea today is completely unclear. So there is of course one problem, we have an evidence that languages, so-called Indo-European languages are connected, they are grammatically, you know, in terms of vocabulary, fine. But how does that connect to Aryans as, as special people with special religion, Vedic religion? It's completely unclear. There is, there is no argument that is showing that this is indeed the truth. And when you look at the kind of speculations again that emerged in the 19th century and are still going on in the discussions, they are placing the homeland anywhere of these so-called Aryans. You know, it could be from the North Pole almost and Caucasus and then maybe Spain and maybe Turkey and maybe this. So this is possibly one of the homeless nations on the earth, these Aryans. <laughs> we have no clue where they come from. And then uh, what, what is, of course, uh, the problem that we point at is how have we come to the idea that some people like Aryans existed. Because this is apparently the intersection of some ideas of religion, race and language where one part of the speculation presupposes the truth of another speculation and they are joining in into one story. So what I would really recommend is uh, if you are in this discussion on Aryans, go read. There is a lot to read on, including the famous, uh, you know, proofs of division between Aryans and Dasyus in the Veda. That spec I can give you as the last remark, but it's again an interesting thing in the history of science. See, when Friedrich Max Miller was asked on these issues, first he was pretty hesitant because physical anthropology was only raising in Britain. It was still more of a linguist speculations that uh, were predominant. But as it took more and more ground, he was looking into Vedas, oh, maybe there is something like that. And he found basically two instances in the whole Vedic corpus, you know, thousands and thousands of hymns and commentaries and things. Yeah, I will be finishing very soon. In all these, he found only two instances and one of them uh, is very vague because he, this is this Anasas, you know. There, there are people without nose. But the traditional understanding in Sanskrit uh, traditions is very different. And then again, uh, the mentions that uh, they are Krishna Tvach of the black or dark skin. Well, uh, People like uh, Hawk, one, one Sanskrit of this era, are able to show you that talking about Krishna Tvach was ascribed to Asuras in many stories, even in Vedic times. So it's completely unclear whether it's related to the characters in the stories or living people as such. And this is all that we have. But physical anthropologists happily picked up people like Riesley they happily picked up and since then onwards you are reading for generations in hundreds of books. We have proofs in the Veda that there was a racial division between those people. That is what we call science. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me just congratulate you, because this morning I've been very impressed. Yesterday I was a little bit shocked that everybody sat in silence while Prakash ji talked about all sorts of things. But the students today have been fairly remarkable, came up with questions, challenged, and then said, but this is my textbook. So thank you. This is what we wanted. Okay, That's the first thing that you should congratulate yourself for actually listening and asking the right questions. Yeah? 
Secondly, why you should congratulate yourself is this. The ideas that are in this book more or less have been in existence for about 15 years or more. Okay? Dr. Balagangadhara has been talking about the caste system, the story behind the caste system for a very long time. I myself took about 10 years to understand what he was saying. And here we are with 10 minute presentations expecting you to understand. So conferences, we know for sure, were invented by the devil because here you are sitting tortured, you have no idea what to do, you're squirming in your seats, you can't respond, and we keep droning on and on and on, okay? So let's try to challenge the devil a little bit, right? My indicator in the audience is one of my students who has come from Ujire. He's sleeping, so I know. Sunadraj never gives me the compliment of covering up his boredom, which is very good, because then I get a clear indication that we're not doing very well. That's okay, right? I have gone into all sorts of statistics. I have a large presentation. I won't go into that. Yeah, I'll wait for your questions because this morning you've proved that you can ask them. So I'll hope that you do, right? So I'll talk about, hopefully briefly, three basic points. And these are points that you should be interested in as law students. But there's not only law students here. And I find that the questions that are coming up are not really from your law background at all. Right? So there are broader questions that we have to come up with. But here I'm appealing to you in terms of one point, which is, what is the stake in this discussion? Why should we talk about it? I mean, after all, it's quite plausible whether the caste system exists or not, that exploitation exists. So if poor people have an instrument to redress that exploitation, why are we talking about academic matters, whether caste system exists or not, who can define it, who cares? When somebody needs to show that they are exploited, there's an instrument that they can appeal to. So surely, as human beings, we want to help people, right? The question that came from the young lady reflected that. For now, I'll only reassure you that I'm a human being. I share this concern, okay? But I'm also going to share with you a larger picture, which is not always evident to us as Indians. In the opening session, uh, Dr. Duncan Jalki told you that there's a Pew Research Center which has come up with certain statistics. In 2015, their report on religious restrictions placed India number four as one of the country where religious restrictions were extremely high. Okay? You might think like I first did, they're looking at Hindu-Muslim conflict. They're looking at the riots. But in 2015, there were no riots. So what are they referring to? Any guesses? Any guesses? Who said that? Thank you. Yes, caste atrocities. The report makes very clear that it's the Hindus who are being oppressed in India, not the Muslims, not the Christians. Okay? Since 95% of Hindus live in India, and since Hindus are being oppressed, India is very high on the scale of religious restrictions placed on Hindus. By whom? by Hindus, okay? Now, if you read the report as an average student in Europe, an average student in the US, anywhere else, you will not be puzzled in the way that an Indian will be puzzled. An Indian will read this and say, wait, 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 Hindus are oppressing Hindus, but why, right? It is not immediately clear to us that caste atrocities 
are religious restrictions. In fact, we never talk about it in that way, right? Nobody that writes a report in India on caste atrocities links it to religious restrictions that are placed. But the 2015 report is on religious restrictions, okay? That's just your, the red light in your brain should be going up, wait, 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 how did this become that? But it has. Hmm? I won't go into the story yet. Now we're number four. I'll take you to the next level of concern. Research centers all over the world produce reports all the time. Why should we care? I'll tell you why you should, quit, why you should care. In 2017, the UN report on religious intolerance quotes the Pew report. Okay? And that report is not based on any kind of original research. It says, you know, we haven't done this research, we're only quoting the Pew Research, but every single statistic they use is from the Pew Research Center. So whether you like it or not, statistics are being generated about India internationally, okay? Which put the country in the light of which other countries? Syria, Nigeria, Iraq, then India. You know what's happening in Syria? Do I need, do I need to tell you? Ooh. Right? They're talking about millions immigrating, suffering. Iraq? You don't know. I'm sure there was a report 10 years ago which talked about Iraq in this way, and that's why the kinds of sanctions that Iraq saw by the United States happened. But I'm just putting this out as a suggestion. I haven't actually done the research. It's a guess. Nigeria, what's happening? Wide-scale slaughter of Christians is happening, okay? Do you see wide-scale slaughter in India? You don't see wide-scale slaughter, you're number four on this report. What are you talking about? You are the most, you're the very highest on the scale of religious restrictions in the world. Do you understand that? You and me, they're the very highest. Okay? That's where India stands internationally. Okay. We are on the watch list of the United States uh, International Religious Freedom, uh, Council of International Religious Freedom, etc., etc. Okay? Fine. Now, okay, let's take it seriously because I said there's two aspects, right? One is there are atrocities, there are people who are exploited. We want to be able to help them. The caste system story at least allows us an instrument to help them. Now I'll give you some statistics. If you look at caste atrocities, what do you look for as data to show caste atrocities? Can anybody tell me? Police cases. Police cases. It's the NCRB data. Yeah? Since 1994, the police was asked to actually generate separate statistics on crime. They always had separate statistics under POA and PCR, okay? That was always there. What is this extra that comes up? The extra that comes up is separate statistics of all crime against SC, ST, all crime, okay? So what is atrocity now? It's not cases under POA and PCR. Atrocity is all crime. And in case you had any doubts, all the studies that have talked about caste atrocities that have emerged in the past five years use this data to talk about atrocities, yeah? So here is my problem. I'm a caste researcher. I'm genuinely interested in understanding caste atrocities. I want to know what is the exploitation, what is the violence that people in India are facing, right? And here is what the statistic will tell me, okay? Here is the amount of crime that is faced by the SCs. 0.53% of criminal incidents, total criminal incidents, happens against 16.6% of the population. Okay. What does that mean?
If you're an SC, you're facing 0.04% of crime. If you're non-SC, you're facing 1.19% of crime in India. Simple, mathematical. Hmm? I can't give you the overall figures, but come and ask, read the book, the article that will give you. So what is my problem? As a researcher who's interested in caste atrocities, who wants to help these people, the data is contradicting everything that I want to make as a case. The data is telling me that the SCs, if crime is atrocity, if crime is atrocity, SCs face much less atrocity than non-SC. Okay? What do you do? These are the kinds of criteria. You're falling asleep again. Wait. I'm coming to it. Wait. These are the kinds of criteria that international uh, NGOs are using in order to talk about caste atrocities. Yeah? But here's the problem. When the Human Rights Watch or any other NGO goes in and measures these criteria, they measure it only in the so-called Dalit population. So what is the dropout rate? Okay, you might have some comparative statistics, SCs versus other Hindus. Ah, but what about compared to Muslims? What about compared to tribals? You don't have statistics. Which means that the instrument that is being used to measure the exploitation of one group, that instrument shows or picks up similar, if not more, exploitation in other groups on that same unit. Whether it is drop out, dropping out of education, whether it is land distribution, whether it is dropout rates, you will find that on none of these criteria would you be able to sustain the story that the SCs are the most at the bottom of this ladder if you did a comparative study. But none of these organizations do a comparative study. None of them. Okay? What is at stake? I told you, I will tell you. So one is this international story. Hmm? If you don't take it seriously, you don't ask, start asking, what is this business about caste atrocities? How do I begin to understand it? If you don't ask this question, very easily, India will face the kinds of sanctions that Iraq faced before it, that everybody else is facing, very easily. Okay? The Pew Research Center doesn't sound very significant. Who's heard of it? I hadn't heard of it until last year. Right? Doesn't sound very significant. But if that's telling the UN what to do, the UN is then telling the rest of the world. The EU already has the story. The US already has the story. Who's waiting for sanctions? You're not even on the Security Council yet. Yeah? Do you understand what your position is? You don't count. Internationally. That's one aspect. But there's a second aspect. Historically, India is seen for the very first time, actually, an anti-SC movement. The Maratha movement in Maharashtra is an anti-SC movement. We never had such movements before. Even if you look at the stories of caste atrocities, the Ranveer Sena, anything else, there were two particular groups. Who were they against? Against that particular jati. Nobody dreamt of a movement that was against not one jati, not one group, one entire cluster which is a government-made group, the scheduled castes. There was no antagonism against this government-made category until today. You want to understand this and you want to understand caste atrocities, for both reasons, because you are concerned about exploitation, you have to get rid of the background story. It's not helping you understand. Okay? I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you.